God bless all of you for joining in with us here in the building today. And those of you who are joining us on Facebook now, we thank God for all of you. Amen. The Bible is very clear to us that there is only one saving name. Amen. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Matthew 28, 19, I believe it was, where Jesus told his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. But then the last part is uh, verse 20, actually, where he said this. Well, I'm sorry, it's the verse before that when he says, All power is given unto me, both in heaven and in earth. Those were the words of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> so today, whatever you have need of, and we're not talking about our wants, our wishes, and our desires today, but we're praying for the needs that are in this room, they will be met Amen. according to the power that is in the name of Jesus. Do you agree with me when you say amen? Amen. Amen. amen? amen. So therefore the word has already been spoken and you have agreed to it. So whatever happens in the rest of this service, it will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. I do have uh, a word from the Lord today to give you if you want to turn in your Bibles to the, to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 61. While you are turning there, I do apologize. We have had technical difficulties with the, the screen again. The airplay ability is gone again <coughs> off the TV. Reinstalled it once and it's gone again, so I don't know what's happening at the Yep, the TV's updating when it's connected to Wi-Fi and it's changing it. I don't know. We have to do that again this week, so just bear with us. Hopefully you brought your electronic device at least, and you can read along Psalm 61. Isaiah? Isaiah, I'm sorry. Isaiah 61, forgive me. usually have trouble with 1st and 2nd Corinthians. That's usually the one I get mixed up on. But Isaiah 61, we'll begin reading at verse number 1. The Bible says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. To give unto them those that mourn. To give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Amen. Bishop, would you speak a word of faith over this word right now? Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus. We believe in your word. We believe in you. And we believe that we have the anointing and the power yes, to do what you ask us to do. I speak in the name of Jesus Christ that we have ears to hear. Let us hear. And Lord God, not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. In the name, in the of, name Jesus, of Jesus, everybody say amen. 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 Thank you, sir. This prophecy was given hundreds of years before it was ever fulfilled. It is amazing that God would give this prophetic word at such a time as he did because Judah and Israel were both, it was a divided kingdom then. And so Israel, the, south, or the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom, were both having their issues with sin. God was sending judgment. He Syrians came to the northern kingdom of Israel, and then the, the, the Chaldeans came to the southern kingdom of Judah, and so they were both at different times taken into captivity. But yet they were also under the heavy burden of the law of Moses. The law of Moses had many requirements. It had many things that they were bound to do for generations. It became more than just the law it became a true burden for them and they, they realized that after a certain length of time, you may have discovered this in your own life, that after some 
few hundred years of this, they understood finally that this was really, I don't want to use the word pointless, but it was, it was pointless for them to try to be completely holy before God and keep all of the rules. But yet the law was holy. The law was just. The Lord was true, but they found out very quickly that they could not keep it. So therefore, when this prophetic word comes, it is it should have been to Israel and Judah a, a word of hope that a Messiah, a deliverer, was coming. But we don't know exactly how many hundreds of years, perhaps maybe even longer, where this prophetic word waited until the time that it was fulfilled in the man Christ Jesus. But the word is pretty clear that there was a Messiah who was coming, who was coming to take away the sins of the entire world, a word that Judah and Jerusalem had trouble understanding. And I would venture to say that in this room this morning, there are some of us, perhaps today, that have gathered here, and we you may not understand what all is happening in your life. You may not understand why you're dealing with the things you're dealing with. You may not understand why addictive behaviors tend to follow you around and dog your steps. But let me just tell you today, you, you've, got your, you've got your struggle, you've got your problem from Adam. Right. That one man in the beginning, the Bible says it's in, in Romans, I believe it's chapter 5, but according to one man's sin, sin is passed to every generation and to every child born of woman, they come into the world with the same issue the same struggle that my friends is the problem in the world right now right but the truth is that we have hope in what this word of god tells us that this one man this messiah who was to come would would come with an anointing on his life and he would preach he would heal he would say he would deliver and that, that seems to be the message that the Lord keeps dealing with me about today, and it is that word of deliverance. Amen. Amen. Maybe that's not your problem today, but I trust that in this room that you will at least let your mind go there. You will at least let the spirit of the word take us to every area of our life and look and see where there is a need for deliverance. Yes. Oh, but I, 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 I've been serving the Lord for, I won't even throw a number out there, just let your imagination, it could be some extravagant number, or maybe it's just a, a short period of time, but the truth of the matter is, lest we forget where God has brought us from. That's right, that's right. That's right. We need to go back and remember what Christ did for us on the tree and how that he came to set the captives free. Amen, right? amen. Oh, but I'm not bound, really. The fact that anyone would say that in this room today is, it, is, it is an indication that there is an area where you are truly bound. Right, right. Hold on one second. I know you can hear that. <laughs> no, Actually, I'm not sure where it's coming from. Something. Anyway, it's not coming from over here. Nothing I did change it. Somebody's hearing that turned up too loud. Why <laughs> is that? Something's coming more. Yeah, it's not loud. Yeah. I don't know where it's coming from. Anyway, everybody okay? Yes. Yeah. All right. So here we are with a promise from God, a prophetic word from God that he has come to, to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. I'm not going to read it all again, but the truth is this prophetic word was given for the souls of men. And no matter what you think about your life today, trust me, if you have been serving the Lord for a long period of time, there is always room for growth. Right. Right. 
It's something that we probably should pay attention to more often. Hello, saints of the Most High. Are you truly satisfied? Have you settled back onto your, your the lees, as it, as it were? Have you settled into a, a comfort zone where you're not, you're not willing to let the Lord stir up your little nest anymore? Or are we willing to say that this scripture applies to me today, that He, the Father, has seen something in me that He would like to change in me? I received the Holy Ghost in 1975. Big deal. If I was still as immature as I was in 1975 unto this day, that would truly be a problem, wouldn't it? Yes. If I was still 13 years old, physically, mentally, emotionally, as I was in 1975, and especially if I was 13 years old or Actually, I was just a day or two old in 1975. If I was still that young in the Lord, mentally and emotionally and spiritually, that would truly be a problem, wouldn't it? Right. But now as a child of God, after serving the Lord now until 2023, 20, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing for us to say to the Lord, I, I want you to take me even further into the things. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. If, there's, if that stirring is not in there today, it will be before this day ends. If you will let your faith out. Come on. Right, right. If you're satisfied, if you're just willing to go through the motions every single day and just live with status quo, religious mentality, fine. Then you can stay there. Jesus will, will back up and he'll take his hands off your life and he'll leave you where you are. But if there is some kind of hunger and desire within you today that pushes you and propels you into Him further and further, deeper into His power and His presence, His will in your life, then trust me, He will meet you at the point of that need. So the prophecy came. And He said, He's coming. A Messiah is coming. And here, here's the thing that I believe the Lord would have us to hear today. When the man Christ Jesus did come, when he showed up on the scene, he came in a form, in a manner in which the Jews were not expecting. You see, they had this mindset that their Messiah was coming as a great military leader. Right. At least that's what they had come to believe. But um, I, I do know the scripture says that he will rule the nations. He will, he will sit on the throne and rule with a rod of iron. He, that, that is happening. It is going to happen. Amen, amen. But it's not yet, and it wasn't then at that time. So they missed his first coming because they could not grasp the fact that this, that this man from Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, would somehow be their Messiah. They mistook his meek and humble spirit as weakness and therefore could never deliver them from Rome, which is not his point, wasn't his coming anyway. What they missed was that this Messiah came to take away the sins of the world, not to drive Rome into the sea, but to save them from themselves. That's where the, that was the true deliverance. It wasn't Rome. Rome was not their problem. The Roman army, the Roman leaders, the taxes, that wasn't their problem. The problem was right here inside of them. Because they had become lost in the law. Those 600 and something commandments that were in the law had turned into a, a, approximately another 400 more. Bishop, I know you probably read the book in Bible College, the, the, um, um, the Words and Works of Jesus Christ. Uh, J.D. Pentecost was the author's name. And I read that book when I got local license, and I read some things in there that were pretty amazing. They had taken the, the leaders, the fathers, the, the religious elite, had taken the Law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, and those other five or six hundred other commandments, and then they had started writing laws and commandments attached to those, thinking that they could somehow strengthen that, therefore making people live away from their lifestyle, but making them more holy. All they did was turn the word of God into, into rituals and, and, and traditions of men. It no, longer be, it no longer was the word of God because it was adulterated by men's philosophies. 
That's what Jesus came to do. And so when Jesus began to pray and speak things that, that contradicted their religious mentality, no way, you're not, you're not getting into my living room with that, that kind of stuff. I've got my religious mentality. I'm going to live by this. I'm going to die by this. And, and finally, Jesus said, you know what? Fine. Go your way. Do your own thing. But there will be a day when you will need me and you will call on me. Amen. And he says in Psalm 1, he says, but there will be a day when I won't even hear your cry. Right. Can I just turn there real quick? In Psalm chapter 1. Actually, it's, it's 2. Psalm 2, he says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine the same thing? The kings of the earth, they set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. You know what that is, right? That's people saying, well, we, we don't want any restraints. We don't want you to speak the word to us and, and bring about conviction for sin. We want no restraints, and we're going to break the bands of those off of us. But verse 4 says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Yes, Lord. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a father's vessel. Yes. Be wise now, thou therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust yes, in Yes, Lord Jesus, him. hallelujah. He said, you're going to call on me someday, yes, and I'm going to cast you aside, and, and I will no longer look at you. But what the Word of God is saying to us today is that that's not the time this morning. The time now is a time of grace, yes. a time of mercy, yes. a time of compassion, that the Messiah has come to yes. set the captives free. Thank Amen. you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Why would he wait so long? Why would he give that prophetic word hundreds of years, maybe even a thousand years before the time of Christ? Why would he not send it then? Because the Bible says that at the appointed time, at the right time, at the fullness of time, the Bible says that Jesus Christ came, born of a woman, born of a virgin in Bethlehem. There was a specific time. And God has always worked in seasons. Yes. God has always worked in a timeline. It's always been here a little and there a little. It was on and on line, precept upon precept. It was always in order and on purpose. Right. And then even though Christ came at the time of he, when he did, and from Adam until the time of Christ, we don't know how many would live back then. We don't know how many of those served the Lord in, in the righteousness that they knew under the law of Moses. We don't know all of that. But we do know that when Christ came, all of those people that were before were not left out. Right, right. Yeah. So what we can say today is that the coming of Christ, when he was born a virgin, when he was born in a stable, in an humble dwelling, with animals around, and the smell of all the activities of animals and hay and all that stuff, that when he came at that time, it was not just for that time, but it was for the time before and the time that would be until he comes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. He didn't leave anybody out. No. So we can't say that his timing was off, could we? No way we could say his timing was off. There's no way that we, we that we could declare somehow that this word was not fulfilled when it was spoken. Yes, the word was there, but men and women were expected to believe right. the word. Amen. Right? That's right? That when the word is spoken, we're expected to put our faith into action and accept this word. And so what happened was when the word was spoken in Isaiah 61, very few took a hold of it. 
Read through the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah and find out what those two, those two prophets of God went through because they spoke the truth. They were not willing to accept that. Jeremiah probably was a little bit more transparent than Isaiah was because there was a time in Jeremiah's life when he was put into stocks and bonds because of what he preached. And stocks and bonds were not in a private location. They were, they were stripped naked and put in a public place and their feet and their hands were in stocks and their feet in bonds. And they were, and they were in a, a very vulnerable position. And they were left there in public places. Right, right. And when all that was said and done, the prophet Jeremiah was released from his stocks and bonds. And he went to the Lord and he says, you know what? I'm finished. I'm done. I will not speak another word in your name. But the Bible says in another, just a verse or two later, he says, you know what? I could not forbear. He said, the word of God was in my tongue. It was like a fire shut up in my bones. And he said, I could not hold it in. So no matter what the word of God is trying to say to us, we're saying it because we are compelled to yes. say it. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. Bishop, even if they, even if, if the ones who hear it don't like it, Come on. I don't have a choice. Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. None of us are given the right to say whether or not we will speak the word or not. If I'm called of God, then I, then I, am, yes. I will be judged according yes. to this word that I refuse to speak. Yes, sir. So what I'm saying to you today is that the word of the Lord has come to set the captives free, to bring deliverance to someone in this room. Yes, yes, Lord. Lord. yes Lord. Don't say it's not me. Because I'm telling you this morning, the word of the Lord is very clear. Right now, there is the spirit of the Lord is beginning to stir. I'm not going to preach very long. But I want you to know that before we leave today, God has come to set somebody free. Why would he send it today? Why would he do it today? Because I'm telling you, I didn't know who would be here. Nobody in this room knew who would be here today. But somehow the Lord says, you know what? I know who's going to get up Sunday morning. And they're going to put their clothes on. And they're going to get in the car. And they're going to drive to 540 South Main. I know who they are. I know what they have need of. And this is what I want you to say to them. Nothing more and nothing less. You say these words and I will fulfill my word upon your people. And my people. The prophet said he's coming. The prophet said there, and that man will come who will redeem Israel from all of their sins. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, the man Christ Jesus has been born. He's about 30 years of age. He's come on the scene. He started healing the sick. He's been raising the dead. And now he goes down to the wilderness and he's in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted of the devil. This is in Luke chapter 4. Not going to get into all the temptations of, of Jesus Christ. That's not the point today. But he was alone in the wilderness for 40 days. And at the when the temptation was ended, the Bible says the angels came and ministered to him. And when he left that wilderness experience, he went down to Nazareth. And I believe this is part of what the Lord wants to hear, wants us to hear this morning. Jesus went to a place where he had grown up. He saw people that knew him. Right. He saw friends and family and loved ones. He saw all of the people that knew who he was. And they had only heard about this man because he had done no miracles in Nazareth. We don't know that he ever did any because we're going to read it here in just a second that he was unable to do it in Nazareth because they, they only viewed him as the son of Joseph. Right. So he comes into Nazareth and goes to the temple. Verse 14. Luke 4 and beginning at verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. There went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And then he 
began to read Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, I, I, I told myself I wasn't going to mention the chosen, but I'm going to mention it here. If you're watching it, also read it with an open mind about what the scripture really says. They've done a pretty good job with this, but as in my imagination, I can only see those people as he says this word, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he, God, hath anointed me. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of of the Most High God. The, 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 the one whom the Bible says in John chapter 1. The Word made flesh. But because their minds were held. And their eyes were blinded. And their hearts were calloused over. That they could not receive this man from Nazareth. Even though he was from there. Anywhere else in Israel. They would say well. Jesus of Nazareth, he was from Nazareth, and one of his own disciples that was called by God said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Wasn't it Nathaniel that said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Yes. That was the mindset of these people. So their eyes were already held that they could not see him for who he was. What is so amazing to me is that they would not even give him He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is where it gets so amazing. He closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. The eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began to say this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears Amen. see there are some commentators who believe that when that when Jesus sat down in that chair Abraham you want to be Jesus for a second it's okay it's not blasphemy I promise have a seat <laughs> You're Abraham at least. <laughs> and when Jesus sat down in that chair, some commentators believed that that chair was more than just for the priest to sit down, but that chair represented the throne of God. Right. And that for someone to actually sit down in that chair and make the proclamation that he made was what got Jesus taken to the brow of the hill and nearly thrown off. Because Jesus sitting down in that chair indicating that he was the son of the most high God. When then he had the audacity to say, this day is the, are these words fulfilled in all of your hearing. Right. I can't imagine how they must have felt in Nazareth, this son of Joseph. They didn't even acknowledge that. That, that he was the son of God. They didn't even acknowledge that Mary's pregnancy was of the Holy Ghost. So what did they believe? Did they still believe that Jesus was an illegitimate child? I'm not speaking blasphemy today. I'm preaching the truth because there are men and women in the world right now who will not accept the Christ simply because of their preconceived notions and ideas about who he is and what he is. Therefore, in Nazareth, they were not able to accept the fact that that man sitting in that chair was God manifest in the flesh. Therefore, we know the scripture says that, not, that Jesus was unable to do many works in Nazareth. Because of their mindset. What does it say about us in this room today? Where is your faith in the Son of Man? Right. Have you already settled it in your mind that He's not able to deliver you? Have you already settled it in your mind that God cannot answer? He hasn't. And so therefore I determine that He cannot and that He won't answer. 
Is that, the, is that what you're thinking? Mm. If it happened in the scriptures, then in reality, it's happening now. Yeah. If people then did not receive the Christ because he did not fit their mold of what they thought the Messiah should look like. They had it in their mind, Brother Baldwin, that he was going to be a military leader. And that he would come into Jerusalem on a big white horse with a king, with a crown on his head as a king, a conquering king, a white stallion. He would conquering kings, that's how they did it. And they would come into that city and walk into the king's court. And that king on the throne had an opportunity to, to abandon his throne and cast his crown at the feet of that other king. And then he would worship he would fall flat on the floor in the prone position, flat out with an arm stretched out in front of him, in a totally defenseless position. That's what a king would do to another conquering king. And to worship Jesus of Nazareth. The word of the Lord is being spoken this morning. Somebody in this room needs to hear what the Spirit is saying. Yes. To worship Him? You expect me to serve the Lord? To give my life holy and acceptable unto Him, which is my reasonable service? You expect me to do that? That's the mentality of the world. And God forbid, and since the world is not in here today, it's us. So therefore, God is speaking to somebody in this room. Mm, my God. You expect me to yield my whole spirit, soul, and body and serve Jesus? Yes. That's what the Bible is telling us. Right. Jesus said, I, I am come. He, the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And if we really looked at that word, poor, Brother Theo, you studied in Matthew chapter 5. You're working on it now. The poor in spirit are those who are in need of a Savior. Right. Right. And Jesus said, I, that's who I have come to. And guess who he came to? The entire world. Yes. So who does that leave out? Nobody. Nobody. So in this room right now, apparently this word is going out to someone in this place today. Somebody needs to hear what the Spirit is saying. And nobody in this room is left out of the equation. Right. Right. Jesus has come to heal the brokenhearted. Yes. He's come to proclaim deliverance to the captives. Yes. Yes. Recovering of sight to the spiritually yes. blind. Yes. Oh, but I'm a Christian. Fine. That's wonderful. It's okay. But he went to the religious just as well as he went to the others. And it was those who claimed to be something that they were not. And he, they, they rejected him because their own preconceived notions and ideas about their spirituality was beyond anything this man from Nazareth could ever do. Hello? Are we, are we blind today? Are, are, are some of us in the room blind to the true condition of our soul? Oh, Pastor, you're preaching to the choir. Yeah, that's how you want to look at it. I am preaching to the choir. But guess what? That camera's staring me in the face. So I'm preaching to myself just as much as whoever wants to hear and receive. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the man Christ Jesus came to the earth to save sinners. And the last thing I read in the scripture is that you and I are still sinning. Amen. I don't want to sin. He gave me the power to say no to sin. But for whatever reason, my fleshly nature still gets up every single morning and has to be dealt with. Amen. And if I don't deal with it, whew, you know, you got the same nature as I do. And if you and I don't deal with our simple nature every single day, it will rule the day. You can act all sanctimonious if you want. I'm not say amen and keep your, your poker face on to, 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 to save the colloquialism of the time. But 
It's the truth about you and me. And we all know it. You'll hear the voice of the religious saying, you know, this really don't apply to me. You know, it's, no, I, I'm a good person. Seriously? Jesus said, Jesus said to that rich young ruler, good master. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What, what did Jesus say to him? Why, why do you call me good? There is none good but why? Jesus was the son of God in flesh. He was God manifest in the flesh, but even he would not take that upon himself. He said, there's none good but one. Read Philippians chapter 2. He was made in the image of man, but he was God in flesh. And he refused to build himself a following on earth. He refused to let them put him on a throne or on a pedestal. He refused to let them do it. He says, because all of the glory belongs to God. And so I am here to humble myself as a servant and to die the death. Right. Maybe we should take time to read the temptations of the Christ to see what he went through, what he could have avoided if he would have accepted just one or two of those things the devil offered him. But he said, no, that's not why I came. You want me to exchange the glory of a heavenly kingdom for dirt kingdoms? He said, that's not happening. I, I would rather humble myself in this life and go to the cross and die the death and then be raised from, the, from dead to life, to eternal life, and go and sit on the throne forever. That's what the Christ did for us. And as it was with the man Christ Jesus. Therefore, if you and I will allow the work of Christ in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 or verse 18. If we will let that work happen in us on the day when he returns. When he goes back to heaven with the bride of Christ. We too will sit on thrones ruling with him throughout eternity. But it won't happen until... We submit to him in this life as it was with the man Christ Jesus. So must it be with us. Amen. If we want to rule and reign with him, if we want to sit in, in heavenly places with him, then we will have to let him be God to us and heal us yes. of our brokenness, yes. yes. to yes. set the captives free, yes. to lose us from our bondage and our chains. Are you telling us the truth? I've got a fact checker here. Got other fact checkers in the room. You know exactly that I'm telling you the truth. As Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so shall every believer, every child of God, will be raised to life just like He was. Yes, yes. Right, right, right. That cannot happen until we first die with Him right. and be buried with Him and be raised to life, being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That. That eternal life that he puts inside of our bosom is that very life that will raise us from death. That's Amen. right. Amen. I don't know if it's something you think about, but Bishop, it's something I think about often. I want to go to heaven. Yes. And I, I'm, if, pardon the, the use of the word, but I'm a little envious at who's buried over there in Restless Cemetery. I'm a little envious. Carol and Esther Evans. I'm a little envious. They ran the race, Ellen, just like your mother. Ran the race with patience. And now, now they, they've lived their life and they serve the Lord faithfully to the very end. And there are many others you could say this about your loved one as well. Husbands of some of you in this room today, they've lived their life already and gone on to meet the Lord. I'm a little envious because. They're no longer dealing with what we deal with on this earth. Right, right. But the truth is, Brother Baldwin, what, what they went through and what we are still dealing with is only part of what God has promised. Yes, we're going to deal with this world. We're going to deal with the sinful nature that we bear in our bodies constantly. But if we will strive to let Jesus be who he said he was in us every single day, we will live to see the coming of the Lord. Yes. 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 Whether it's naturally or whether it's living spiritually, we will see his coming again. Right. 
baby. I don't want to live that long. I'm sorry. I don't, don't want to live. I know it sounds odd. She hates it when I talk like this. So I don't, I don't think I'm going to die today. I don't think God's finished with me today. Bishop, I'm ready to go whenever he wants to come get me. Yeah. Ain't Marilyn? I'm ready to go anytime he's ready to come. But until he comes, I've got to deal with what allows what he allows to come against us. Right. Is he the one who allows it? Absolutely. Well, yeah. that was an underwhelming amen. <laughs> Do you not believe that God is sovereign in the affairs of men? Yes, yes. yes he is. Did he give the devil permission to touch Job? Yes. yes, he did. So if he gave Job permission, if he gave the devil permission to touch Job, then guess what? Every single day he comes to see and test our faith and whatever he needs to do to reveal how much faith I have to me, not to him. He does it to reveal whether or not I have faith in him. Hello, somebody. Well, I said I wasn't going to preach long, but you're making it hard for me to just stop. <laughs> I didn't eat breakfast either, so I'm hungry. I'm ready for some lunch. But we're not walking out of this room until God has done his perfect work. And it doesn't have to take a long time. Right, right, right. All it takes is your faith and my faith to connect with the faith of the Lord Jesus Do you know that the scripture says that you, you can go sit down, Jesus? <laughs> Do you know that Jesus died on the cross by the grace of God? Yes. Everything that Jesus went through, Brother Baldwin, he went through it with the same needs that you and I are going through it right now. Right. He, yes, he was God manifest in the flesh, but yet he humbled himself and became obedient unto the cross. So that he could fulfill the full word of God. So therefore when we come behind him. And we hear the words of, of the Lord Jesus saying. That the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. If I can hear these words. And apply these words. Then what Jesus did for me at Calvary. He's ready to fulfill it. Yes, yes. To. Amen. 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 So what am I saying? I'm saying that somebody in this room. Somebody or somebody's needs to alter your mind right now. Oh, he can't save me. I've done too many wrong things. Eh. Sorry, that doesn't fly. That's right. The Apostle Paul said he was the chief of all sinners. Come on. How could the Apostle Paul say he was the chief of all sinners? I, I'm not sure that I have. A, a, a real complete answer for you, but according to what Paul said, and in, in, it's in First Timothy chapter one, when he said he was the chief of all sinners, and that God saved him first, as an example to all who would follow after him. Right. Go read it. It's in First Timothy chapter one, and this is how the Lord explained it to me, because. The Apostle Paul was the first non-eyewitness of the man Christ Jesus. Right. So the Bible says, he even says it himself, that he was one as of one born out of due time, which meant he was not there for the life of Christ. So he was, as far as I can understand the scriptures, he was the first non-eyewitness to be filled with the Holy Ghost. What does that say to us? Obviously, we live in the 21st century. We're nowhere near the first century church. So neither are we eyewitnesses. So when the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, therefore we need to pay attention to the words of the Apostle Paul. So when he says that he was the chief of all sinners and that God saved him first, well, if you don't believe me, Go. I'll try to quit. Come on. First Timothy chapter 1. Let's just read it so you'll know it's there. First Timothy 1, verse 15. Jesus. 
This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Listen to the words. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy. That in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. For a pattern to them we should hereafter believe on him to life and rest. So let me just go ahead and debunk the thoughts that are in some of your minds right now. That if the Apostle Paul was the chief of all sinners in this dispensation, and God saved him as an example for the rest of us, then therefore, according to the Bible, you have not sinned beyond the Apostle Paul. Thank That's you, right. Lord. Thank you, Lord. So therefore, Whatever you're thinking about the Christ, it needs to be adjusted right now. Amen. 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 Jesus Christ came into the world to save. Yes. John 3, 16, he didn't come to judge the world. He came to save the world. But he said, you know what? There will be a day. It won't be me sending you to hell. It will be my word that I have spoken to you. That will be the word that condemns you on that day. But yes. right now, this word is nowhere near condemning you. The only thing it condemns is sin. Amen. The Bible says that if we're willing to send our sins on ahead in repentance, that he will judge our sins today. And then when we stand before him on the day of judgment, it won't be me he's judging. My works, yes, he'll judge my works, and I'll enter into heaven with my reward. But my sins are already being sent ahead every single day. Every single day when I get up in the morning, if I've got sin in my life, it's, I'm sending them on. He's judging my sin, but I'm, I have grace every single day. Yes, Lord. Thank you. This is the word of the Lord. Right. So would you close your eyes? You haven't gone too far. You haven't sinned too far. Not, even if you have walked away from Jesus. Even if you used to serve him, but now you do not. You still haven't offended him to the point that he would reject you. Oh, but there is a sin. Yeah, I know. There is that sin of that, has, that has eternal consequences. That sin is not in this room. Nobody in this room at least from the discerning of spirits that is working in me, has, has ever sinned to the point of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. So therefore, therefore, if you need to deliverance, if you need your broken heart healed, oh, not, not from a, a broken relationship, that's not the brokenness of the heart, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a broken heart that has been bruised by sin. And Jesus wants to heal that bruised, broken heart. That's your soul. That's the innermost part of your soul. That's the heart. That's the brokenness of the soul. And this is what Jesus has come to do, to heal the broken heart. To set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Acceptable year of the Lord. Behold, now, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart. Come on. Don't harden your heart. The Messiah has come. And we pray for the nation of Israel every single day. We pray that the Jews will believe the gospel and obey the scriptures. We pray that their eyes will be open. But I'm praying that in this room today, that some blind eyes to the gospel will be open. What does it mean? It means that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He died. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. And when Peter preached that glorious message of the gospel, he preached about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And then he showed us how to apply it. 
repentance. I humble myself in death, as it were, dying out to my own will, my selfish desire, and repenting of every wrong. And then I am buried with Christ in baptism. I go down in water in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of the sins that I just repented of are now washed away, cast behind his back, thrown into the sea to be remembered no more. The record book in heaven blotted out like a big cloud. And then when we rise from the grave of, of that water baptism, we, we, we are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we begin to speak with other tongues. That's the acceptable year of the Lord. Is there anybody? Is there anybody in this room right now? Every eye closed. Every head bowed if you need to to keep yourself focused on the Lord. We don't want anybody to feel conspicuous this morning, but the Lord is reaching to somebody. I have come, he says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and I have come to do these things for you, but I can only do what you allow me to do. So would you humble yourself with your eyes closed first before we stand, before we make a official altar call this morning? Would you close your eyes towards heaven and open your mouth to him and tell him what it is you're thinking? Can he really do what he is saying to you? Can he heal your broken heart? Can he bind up all the wounds? Can he set you free from the bondage of addiction, where, whatever it is? Can he do it for you? It's not a question, will he or can he? But the question is, can he do it for you? It's not whether or not he has the power to save. It's whether or not we will allow him to save Come on, church. If it's not, this is not applying particularly to you at this moment, would you at least let yourself pray in the Holy Ghost? In just a minute, we're going we're gonna to make this whole room an altar. But we're giving everybody a chance at this moment to focus. If God's dealing with you to repent, then do it. Come on. Do it now. Those of you watching with us on Facebook, now is the accepted time. We're not putting this off to a later date. You need to be, you need to be refilled with the Spirit. You need to, a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you'll just let your heart out, Jesus will, full, will fulfill His word to you. Come on, that's it. We're gonna make this whole room a prayer room. We'll make it an altar. This whole room an altar. But in a minute, the Lord's gonna ask for some commitments. Come on. In a minute, we are going to have an altar call. We're going to show to him that we mean business for him. But right now, this is for just a second or two longer. I need him. I need him. No man can save himself. We can't redeem ourselves. We can't live enough, right enough. We can't, we can't keep the rules enough. I can't do enough right things and of very few wrong things. I can't do anything to save myself. But what I can do, I can humble myself before Him. Admit that Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, as He called Himself, did come to save me and that He can at this moment rescue my soul from hell. Come on, can He do it for you? Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, in the name of Jesus, you have come to seek and to save that which was lost, to redeem us from all unrighteousness. Did you hear it? To redeem us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Every wrong. Oh, but I received the Holy Ghost in 1975. Oh, yeah. You've done some unrighteous things in that period of time. And he said, I, I, I'll, I'll cleanse, I'll forgive, I'll abundantly pardon and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and sin. And would you keep praying? And would you stand to your feet? In the name of Jesus, come on, would you keep praying? Keep letting your voice out. 
We're going to move forward little by little, but God's moving. Nobody needs to leave this room dissatisfied with your experience with Jesus. Come on, is there any hunger? Is there any hunger whatsoever in you? Is there any desire whatsoever for the things of God inside? Is there any shred of conviction still working in you? Come on, there's no shame here. This is not condemnation that's working here. This is the love and the grace of God that's being poured out. Jesus Christ on the cross was the love of God manifest to sinners. That's the love of God. The devil's lying to some of you. The devil is lying to you. The love of God is still reaching. The grace of God is still active for you. In the name of Jesus, come on, one more raise with your voice, and we're going to come to the altar. We're going to make an altar call. Open this for everyone that wants to come. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we bless you, Holy Father. We glorify you, Holy Father. In the name of Jesus, yes, my Lord, in Jesus' name. Yes, my Father, in Jesus' name. Come on, just a little bit longer. One second more. In the name of Jesus. My Lord and my King. So would you now begin making your way to this altar? It may not be for everybody. But as the Lord moves upon you now, the Lord is calling out to us to make a commitment to serve the Lord forever. Whatever He's got to do in us. I'm willing to repent again. I'm willing to humble myself again. I'm willing to say to the Father, not my will, but thine be done. That's it. Just close your eyes and raise your hands. Yes. In the name of Jesus, I need some of you ladies to come. Put your hands on her and pray the prayer of faith. In the name of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord has come to set the captives free. Jesse, you will call on the name of Jesus. You know what it means to repent. You know what it means to ask Him to forgive. So you do it right now. Whatever it is, you ask Him to forgive. Whatever that, that thing is. You believe it was good. You believe it was good. You believe it Hey! 
And you know, he sees us all in the day. Yes. Come on, somebody in the room is still here.
get on my face before God and say, Father, I refuse to let the world take my son Amen. That's from right. this place. That's right. You and I have the opportunity. It's not just about coming to church and punching in and making our families happy or whatever. It's about becoming together, yes. becoming encouraged in one another, become stronger in one another. Because when we walk out this out this door, I promise you, we're in the greatest battle that has ever been established in the world today. That's right. It's a spiritual warfare. That's it. And if you don't think that you're not in it, you're probably are, you're already a POW. Help us, Father. You're already a prisoner. Come on, right. yes. And I'm here to tell you, just like I was in the military, I'm fixing to kick down your door. Come on. And come and rescue you if I have to pop you in the jaw. That's all right. Come on. I'm going to do it in the spirit. I used to do it physically. <laughs> but in the spiritual realm, because there's a place that Jesus wants us to be in, and that's to be with him. I want to be with I don't want to burn in hell for eternity. That's, that, that, that's, prepared, that's prepared for the devils, the imps. Well, God, if God's a loving God, he won't send me to hell. No, he won't send you to hell. It's already been established. Your word, the word of God is going to be the judge of the things that we, we, we go up. We chose to go to hell. All right. That's true. Or I choose to make heaven my home. And I'm going to tell you something. To me, you have to be a, a stronger man than anything else in this world to establish yourself and say, I want to make heaven my home. Yes, amen. The weakest men in the world are the ones who walk into the face of the devil. I decided a long yes, time ago, that's good. I am going to make heaven my home, no matter what it costs me. That's right. I'm going to make heaven my home. Yes, amen. This world has nothing to offer me. Bitterness doesn't have nothing to offer me. Hatred has nothing to offer me. Jealousy has nothing to offer me. You, you thought I was going to talk about money and stuff like that. Even the, pe the people that have the most money in the world have jealousy have bitterness. They have hatred. All right. And they're not very happy. Yes, amen. Right. The Bible talks about the poor, so you can allude to it today. The poor is not the people that are sitting on the corner of the street drinking a beer and can't hardly afford a hamburger. The poor is not knowing who Jesus is. That's right. right. And I hate to think that there's any poor in here. All right. Help us, Father. Yeah. Yes, amen. But unfortunately, we have some poor in the spirit in this place right now. Now you can look around and see who that is. You could might have to go to the bathroom and find out who that is when you look in the mirror. Help us, Father. I'm not getting on to you. I'm trying to let you understand something. Jesus is coming back very, very yes, soon. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. If he comes back in 100 years, that's pretty soon for you. Yes. Yes. But I don't think it's going to be 100 years. Help us, Father. I don't think that I will die. Sister Mary, I don't want to die. I I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to die. I want to be caught up yes. to them. I want to, I want to be in so involved in this end time harvest and revival. Oh, I'm too old. I, I think about my poor old dad and some of the older people I hear. I'm 80 this. I'm 90 this. I think of my poor old dad at 94 preaching at a church last Sunday. There you go. Never heard him want to say, I want to die because I want to go see Jesus. He always talks about, I want to do the will of God. Amen. And knowing the will of God is dying, and so be it. But the will of God is for me to live. I want to do the best I can to see other people say. Amen. 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 I don't want to be a part of this great end time harvest Amen. than Amen. ever before. But he's trying to get the church ready first. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. You, you realize how 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 sick America is right now? Yes. Yes. And unfortunately, some of that sickness is trying to creep yes. into the church. Help us, Father. And we can't allow that to happen. That's right. That's, That's right. right. I am not going to allow my, my children, my grandchildren, your children, your grandchildren to be sold as sex slaves. Come on. Help us yes, sir. Yes, Jesus. Well, that will never happen to us. <laughs> we need to stand up. Be careful. Be careful what you say. Yes. Pray for your children like you've never prayed for them before. Yes, sir. Pray for them. Like yes, 
and your kids might be grown, <laughs> you still need to pray for them. I, I guarantee you, my 94 year old dad prayed for me just as, as hard as he did when I was eight years old. And I'm 60, be 64 this year. So I'm thankful for a praying dad. My mother's dead, it's gone, but my dad's still alive and he's still praying. God bless you. I love you very much. But greater than that, Jesus loves you greater. Amen. 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 Make sure you say something to him. Just send me a high five. Slap somebody on the side of the face. Back to the head. Do something. You look like you're alive today. I guarantee you, if you slap somebody on the back of the head, you're going to find out they're alive. <laughs> So you don't have to slap me on the back of the head, I'm alive. <laughs> Thank you.